I'm sure that at some time or another, you've seen pictures that showed the before and the after of something or someone. Well, on today's program, we'll be taking a look at the before and after of one who becomes a Christian. Please stay tuned. The Churches of Christ of the North Texas area present The Truth in Love. How precious is the good divine by inspiration given. Bright as the lamp is precept shine to guide my soul to heaven. Holy by divine, precious treasure mine. Lamp to my feet and the light to my way to guide me safely home. This lamp through all the tedious night of life shall guide my way Till I behold the clearer light of an eternal day Holy but divine, mine, precious treasure thou art mine Lamp to my feet and the light to my way To guide me safely home Good morning and welcome to The Truth and Love. I'm Leslie Parts, your host for today's program. It's a privilege to be back on the program today and to be able to introduce today's speaker. I'll do that in just a little bit. First, I want you to get a pencil and a piece of paper ready. In just a few weeks, we're planning to have a question and answer program. We'll take the questions that you send in and answer as many as possible on that program. So please take down our address and send in your questions. Here's the address. The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas, 76053. The announcer will give you that address again at the end of the program. Let's have another song, and then I'll introduce today's speaker. Come, let us all unite to sing. Today's speaker is one with whom you'll be familiar if you've watched our program before. He's a regular host on The Truth and Love and is the preacher for the Brown Trail Church of Christ in the greater Fort Worth area. Occasionally, though, he leaves his position as host of this program and delivers the message. He always does an excellent job, and I'm sure that today will not be an exception. It's my privilege to present to you David Roper. Let me add my welcome. We always appreciate your being with us for this particular program. I pray that today's program will be a very special blessing. 
As Leslie mentioned at the beginning of our presentation today, I'm sure that these words before and after are familiar words to us. When I was a boy, we used to see them on the back of many, many magazines. Now today, if you see the pictures, you will probably see, well, a rather large sort of person. I don't want to use the word fat, a rather large sort of person, and then a rather thin sort of person. But now when I was a boy, the pictures are more like that shown at the beginning of the program. There was this fella, and generally someone was kicking sand in his face, a very sad story. And then there was the after picture of a fellow, very, very muscular, and of course the change was always so dramatic. And uh, someone like me would look at that picture and say, oh, I would love to have that change take place in my life. But now, in the ads, there was not only the before and the after, there was also an emphasis put on the something between, because this is what the ad was selling. The ad always emphasized that before you can have this kind of change, there has to be something to cause that change. Though they didn't use the words, the idea was you cannot have an effect without having an adequate cause. Now that something between was a great many things. It might have been some kind of exercise program. I know when I was a boy, I always wanted to take the Charles Atlas course, use that dynamic tension, which today is just called isometrics. And uh, of course today you may belong to a health club or something else. Some kind of exercise program can bring that about. Maybe it's some kind of a special diet plan, health foods, vitamins, or whatever. Or then, of course, uh, there was always that proverbial tonic that could just cure most anything. But whatever it was, the ad always emphasized you don't want to be like this, you do want to be like this, and if you want the change, you have to go this particular route. If you have your Bibles, and I hope you do, I want you to turn with me to the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 2. Because in Ephesians chapter 2, there's going to be a picture given much more dramatic than just the change from a rather skinny person to a muscular individual. Much more dramatic than the change that would take place from an individual a little bit overweight to someone rather slim. It is a spiritual picture. Ephesians chapter 2 began so wonderfully, and you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. It gives marvelous teaching on the matter of grace. But for our purposes, I want to zero in the latter part, or on the latter part of the chapter. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 2, I'm beginning reading in verse 12. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ, for he is our peace, who hath made both one and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. And came and preached peace to you which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints, and of the household of God and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed to gather groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now let's go back up to verse 12. In verse 12 we find the apostle Paul as he pictures the pit from which they had ascended the depths to which these individuals had gone in sin. And he begins with a very, very strong phrase as he says, at that time, in those previous times, you were without Christ. Now for just a few moments, consider what it means to be without Christ. Think of all the biblical passages that use that word Christ. Think of the prophecies about Christ. Think of all the blessings to be found in Christ. Think of all that Christ has done for us. And now think what it means to be without Christ, to have His blessings, a knowledge of Christ, 
to have that special relationship with him. But he continues on with their situation and says, At that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise. Now most of the ones to whom he is speaking were Gentiles. And Gentiles, of course, had not been part of the covenant relationship of the Jewish people. God had dealt with the Gentile uh, nations, but most of them had by and large departed from God, and they were aliens from all that was sacred and true. Now you cannot appreciate that unless sometime you have lived as an alien in a country without having the buffering situation of being surrounded by Americans, and to find out what it means to be without the particular blessings of citizenship. My family and I were privileged to spend some ten years in Australia. It was a pleasant experience, but from time to time we were reminded we were still aliens. We did not have the right to vote. We were taxed. We had taxation without representation. But we could not vote, and we could not hold public office. There were certain privileges we did not have. We were aliens. We were not citizens. But again, he says, Without Christ being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, he says, now your situation is so bad that you have no hope. Isn't that a tragic, tragic phrase? Today, what is it that keeps us going? Today, what sustains us? Is it not so many times our hope? We may be in poor health physically, but if we just have a little hope we're going to get better, we can make it day by day. Finances may be in terrible shape, but if there's some hope there that things are going to improve again, we can survive. We may have family problems. We may have marital problems, all kind of problems, but a little hope out there keeps us going. But these individuals were without hope. A few years ago it was the privilege of my family to go through many parts of the world, including Rome, and we visited the Roman catacombs. And though I could not read the inscriptions on those little holes in the wall that were the graves of early Christians, we were told the most common inscription is the word hope. They were persecuted. They had to even go underground to bury their dead, but they had hope, and that kept them going, and at last they conquered the great Roman nation. Now above the ground, a short distance away, are the graves, the tombs of the very rich pagan of that day. And these are beautiful, they're ornate, but there's an inscription missing and that is the word hope. Their night was simply a blackness without a single star. To have no hope is indeed a tragic, tragic situation. But again we continue in the before picture, having no hope and without God in the world. I cannot imagine a greater tragedy than to be without God, the God who made all things, the God who loved us, the God who cares for us, and to be without God in the world. Well, it's terrible to be without God, but especially as we consider that we're without God in this world, the tragedy increases. This world that presses against us, this world that seems sometimes to be trying to tear the heart out of us, to be without help in this world is indeed a terrible thing. A little boy came in. He said to his mother, he said, Mother, mother look what I've done. And he had a tall weed, about so tall, taller than he was. He was dragging it in. It still had the dirt on the roots there. Mother was not greatly impressed with the weed he had pulled. She was looking more at the dirt that was being drug in. And so he had to add this thought. He says, Mommy said, I pulled it up, and the whole world was pulling against me. Can't you identify with that little boy? Doesn't it sometimes feel this whole world is pulling against you? This whole world is trying to destroy you. And to be without help, without strength in this world is a terrible thing. But these were without God in this world. How could we then summarize their spiritual state before? Paul uses a single phrase, back up to verse 1 now in chapter 2, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Only one word would suffice. They were dead. They were separated from God. They did not have the blessings of God. And in that separation they were dead spiritually. Now if you and I had looked at the city of uh, Ephesus so long ago, 
We would never have used the word dead in connection with that city. It was a bright, vibrant metropolis. You could see the colorful garments as people passed through the streets. You could just see the vitality of that city. But when Paul looked upon that city, he saw a vast cemetery. And everywhere there was a person, he saw a tombstone. And on every tombstone he saw inscribed these words, Dead in sin. You know, today, if a person is ever going to be saved, it is so important that that individual look at his state to realize that if he is without Christ, if he's not a child of God, he's an alien from the commonwealth of Israel, he has no hope, he's without God, he's dead in his trespasses and sins. Well, as my brother said a few weeks ago, that's the sad part of the story, that's the bad news. But as we continue on in verse 13, we begin to see the good news. And we're going to see everything that has been said in verse 12 is turned around in the next few verses. But I want to suggest that not only are these things turned around, that actually they are more than turned around. Let me just place a plus sign right there. You see, God doesn't just change things. God always gives to us so abundantly. If I had time, I would love to go to Romans, the fifth chapter, and see there as it talks about what happened when Adam sinned and then as each one of us sins in our own lives. And then to see that phrase and much more that's used time and time again. As it's stressed, this happened because of sin, but through Christ, much more, the pluses that come as a result of a person being close to Jesus Christ the plus sign of God. And, and we'll see this now as we go through these verses. Now there's the before side. Now let's begin to look at the after side in the verses that follow. At one time without Christ. Now notice verse 13. But now in Christ Jesus, you who sometimes were far off are made nigh or near by the blood of Christ. At one time without Christ. Now to just reverse that would be to say they were with Christ or had Christ, but they're more than that. He says you are now in Christ Jesus. That's a marvelous phrase. I don't know that I perfectly understand it. Mr. Smith talked about it last week to be in Christ. It means I'm, I'm in the body of Christ, which is the church. Ephesians 1, 22, 23. I'm in a special relationship with Christ. Uh, I have, I'm in His love. I'm, I'm in all of His blessings. But it's a phrase so marvelous, it really just expands and goes beyond my comprehension. I just appreciate that. A relationship with Christ, so beautiful, it can only be expressed with that phrase, in Christ. Again, at one time you were aliens. Now, you're no more aliens. Now you're a citizen, the kingdom of God. And if you have your Bible, let's go down now to the latter part, verse 19 of this chapter. Now, therefore, you're no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints. At one time an alien, now you're a citizen with all the blessings of citizenship. But yea, more, notice the last part, you're of the household of God. You're not just a citizen living side by side on the block. You're in the same family. You're in the same household. What a blessing. But again, at one time you had no hope. Now, let's go back up to verse 14 and see the hope they had. For he is our peace who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain or two one new man, so making peace, that he might reconcile both unto God and one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off. I tell so many reasons why they should have hope. Jesus came. Jesus died for us. Jesus broke down the middle wall of partition between Jew and Gentile. And he says, as a result of this, you have a very special blessing. That blessing is peace. Notice three times that word is found. Verse 14, he is our peace. At the end of verse 15, so making peace. Verse 17, and came and preached peace to you which are afar off. How wonderful it is, regardless of what this world may do to us, to realize that we can have peace in this old world. That's hard to realize sometimes, isn't it? This world is so much with us and the troubles and the trials of this world, and we say, well, if I could just have this situation or that situation, I'd have peace. No. No, peace is not found in outward circumstances. Peace is found within. It's found in a relationship with God, so that regardless of what happens, well, then myself, there's peace and security and contentment. 
But again, at one time you were without God. Now he says, you not only have God, you have become the very habitation of God, the very dwelling place of God. Now at the very last of this particular chapter, we're built, verse 20, upon the foundation, the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed to gather groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. We not only have God, God dwells within us. In Acts the second chapter, people are told to repent, be baptized, for remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit, God's own Spirit, to help you live the Christian life. Now, we're not talking about something miraculous. We're not talking about God grabbing you by the scruff of the neck and saying, now, you've got to live this way. Now, we're talking about the personal nature of God who, through His Word, through His providence, helps us and strengthens us as we strive to live the Christian life according to His Word, the very habitation of God. Well, how can we summarize now this situation? Previously, the only word that was adequate was the word dead. Now, what word shall we use to describe the after picture? And look now at the beginning of the chapter. The King James translation, And you hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. If you don't have the King James, we need to run down to verse 5. Even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you're saved. I don't know if that word quickened or quick means too much to you. It apparently didn't to one man who tried to describe all the pedestrians in downtown Dallas as either quick or dead. Well, it doesn't mean fast. It rather is the opposite of dead. It means alive. He says, And you hath God made alive who were dead in trespasses and sins. At one time dead, at one time away from God. But now you're alive in Jesus Christ. Isn't that a marvelous, marvelous thought? But now let me emphasize this thought. As we look at these two states, and I hope we can appreciate them because we'll never desire to become Christians unless we appreciate this. As we look at these two thoughts, we ask the question now, how does this change take place? You see, there cannot be an effect unless there's an adequate cause. What brings this about? And you probably already anticipated me and uh, have guessed that this plus sign that I have up here is not really a plus sign, but it's rather the cross of Jesus Christ. One time a group of math students were crossing the university campus. Evening was coming on and they saw the steeple of a church building silhouetted against the sky with a cross in evidence. And one of them, trying to be humorous, said, well, that looks like God's plus sign. Well, he said more than he realized, for indeed the cross is God's plus sign to give us so many marvelous blessings from the hand of Almighty God. We could, of course, talk about so many blessings, but let's look here at the passage again to stress that it's through the cross, and we mean by that not the piece of wood, but through the death of Jesus that these blessings come. Notice in verse 13, we're made nigh by the blood of Christ. In verse 15, he abolished in his flesh. In other words, that flesh on the cross. Verse 16, we're reconciled unto God in one body by the cross. It's through the cross of Christ that this marvelous change takes place. And now this thought, and listen to me so very, very carefully. I received a letter a couple of weeks ago. A lady said, well, I'd hate to think that after God had done all of these things for me, he then turned it back on me and said, now, you have to do something. Well, it is back on you. Jesus died for everybody, we're told. And yet, not everybody is saved. We're told in Matthew, the seventh chapter, verse 13 and 14. It's back on man. Will you accept what Jesus did? That's the question that comes. Now, you see, being saved by the cross of Christ involves a lot of things. We've already suggested it means to be in Christ. And that phrase is found a number of times in this passage, isn't it? But notice also in verse 16, that being in Christ is just the same as being in the church. In verse 16, that he might reconcile both, that's God, uh, or, or Christ rather, might reconcile both Jew and Gentile unto God, notice it, in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. Now we're saved by the cross, but where are we saved by the cross? We're saved in one body. What's that one body? Back up to the previous chapter, verse 22 and 23. 
And God hath put all things under His feet, under Jesus' feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, listen to it, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. When we talk about reconciliation in the body, we're talking about reconciliation in the church. I've got to be in the church of the Lord to be in Christ, to take advantage of what God did for me. Now, how do I do that? How do I take advantage of it? We go to verse 8, that familiar passage. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God. Coy talked about that a few weeks ago, God's wondrous gift to us. Grace includes all that God does for us. Faith includes all that we do in response to that. That includes, as Mr. Smith noted last week, that includes my repentance, that includes my confession, that includes also my being baptized into Jesus Christ. I hope you remember last week's lesson, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, Romans the 6th chapter, verse 3 and 4, both stress so well, we're baptized into Christ. We're baptized into that body. 1 Corinthians the 12th chapter and verse 13. Look at yourself this morning. Am, are you in the before picture? Are you in the after picture? If there's a need in your life, a spiritual need in your life, I pray you'll take care of that need by taking advantage of God's own provision. We can help you. Give us a call. Write to us. We want to let you know that we love you. We care for you. And we want to help you in any way we possibly can. May God bless you. Until next week. Depending on the promises of Christ my King Through eternal ages let His praises ring Glory in the highest I will shout and sing Standing on the promises of God Word of God, I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God, my Savior, standing on the promises, standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises of Christ the Lord. Bound to Him eternally by love's strong cord, Overcoming daily with the Spirit's sword, Standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, Standing on the promises, Standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing on the promises, Standing on the promises. I'm standing on the promises of God. This has been The Truth in Love, sponsored by the Churches of Christ of the North Texas area. For a copy of today's program, additional information, or Bible correspondence course at no charge to you, please write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. Once again, write The Truth in Love, Post Office Box 865, Hearst, Texas 76053. We invite you to attend the Church of Christ in your area. Join us again next Sunday at the same time for The Truth in Love.